and we're comparing these to meteorite samples. Wow. Well, we know if somebody didn't step on a meteorite or get one whacked through the back of his hand, it wouldn't so have happened. So it has to come from outer space. It had to come from outer space, and they're calling them meteorite samples. So that was rather mind-blowing. So that was the beginning of the scientific aspect. So I figured, well, you know, if we're going to carry on with this, we better set up some scientific protocols and criteria for doing this kind of work. Uh, and then we formed our 501c3 nonprofit organization, ANS Research, and uh, no charges that were then ever made to um, any of the surgical candidates. I see. Now, I know, because you've written a lot of books, clearly, most people must have heard about them. How many people ask you, can you inspect me and see if I have any alien implants inside my body? Do you get a lot of emails per day? Well, I get a tremendous amount of emails, so sometimes 3,500 a day. Wow. <laughs> and uh, yes, we have now instituted a methodology, a scientific methodology, for looking at the possibilities of whether somebody might have an object in their body. <laughs> and Steve uh, and I both have uh, equipment that we can go, for example, to a conference. Let's say, you know, tomorrow an alien reveals himself to the general public. How would you say people would react? Would there be mayhem and riots, or how would it go? Well, if the alien presence were known uh, suddenly, you know, one day. For example, I always I like to use the example of a huge uh, multi-football field alien craft <laughs> landing on a busy freeway during rush hour. Would there be a panic? Uh, the answer is yes, there would be a panic because people would be on their cell phones calling Caltrans to see how long they were going to have to sit there before that thing got <laughs> out of the way so they could go back to get home to watch the Lakers game. But see, it just indicates the, the quality of life that we have here in the United States. Probably the least important thing of uh, an, an individual who lives in the United States, at least, uh, is uh, extraterrestrial beings. As long as it doesn't interfere with you personally, then it could be fine, or it could be not fine, or who, who cares? But because that relationship has been made fun of for so many years, well, we don't even take it, uh, the common uh, person doesn't even take it seriously. So the world is changing, and the world has got to know, finally know, the truth. You know, uh, government sources and private industry has taken over most of the knowledge of, you know, the extraterrestrial presence. Yeah. I guess, do you have any good guesses as to why aliens would contact us? You know, what, what, makes, uh, what makes us stand out that aliens would want to put their implants inside of us? Well, I think in order to understand what the alien approach is to human life on Earth, we have to have a good understanding of our history, which we don't and which nobody seems to care about except a few. But if you go back and you look at ancient history and you look at ancient paintings and wood carvings and so on, even liturgical paintings with Jesus, you're going to look up and you're going to see a typical saucer UFO craft flying around even back in those days. So, you know, we don't know where we came from. We've been looking for the missing link for year after year after year. Where's the missing link? If we look at the writings of uh, Zachariah Sitchin, the late Zachariah Sitchin just passed away, um, and he wrote a set of books called The Earth Chronicles. And he says that 435,000 years ago, from another planet in our solar system called Nibiru, the uh, group uh, race of individuals called the Anunnaki came here, and their head geneticist, whose name was Enki, manipulated what was already here into human beings. Wow. So
So if we don't understand the history of, of uh, where we came from in the first place, how can we possibly understand the, the present or the future of where we're going with all this? Jack Graham will now speak to Stephen Colburn, chemist and material scientist, in regards to the implants removed by the alien abductees. So, can you tell me a bit about yourself and your role within this program? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Steve Colburn. I'm a material scientist. Um, I was educated at UCLA, and um, I uh, work in Camarillo, just a few blocks from where uh, Dr. Lear works. And um, uh, after we met, um, uh, we decided to have a collaboration on uh, analyzing these objects more thoroughly. Um, a lot of the objects that he removed had not been analyzed um, adequately, so. Um, uh, I have uh, done a lot of uh, microscopy and um, elemental analysis on these objects and uh, come up with some interesting findings. Um, one thing we found out is that um, the devices are definitely nanotechnological, uh, <laughs> nanotechnological devices. Um, they're not just simply uh, metallic objects that somehow got into the body. Um, they contain carbon nanotube electronics and carbon nanotubes are the field I'm working in in my, my regular job. Um, and uh, they give off radio signals um, and um, they have uh, odd nanostructures in them made of carbon nanotubes. Uh, carbon nanotube electronics are a uh, hot topic in material science today, uh, by the way, and there's many amazing properties about them. The aliens have apparently perfected the technology to use carbon nanotubes in these devices. And um, uh, there are proprioceptor nerves that, that um, go into these, uh, the tissue capsule or a gray uh, membrane around these devices. And um, well, one, of the, one of the most fascinating findings was that, um, that these devices contain, uh, many of them contain meteoric iron uh, from the, uh, judging from the trace element pattern of um, gallium, germanium, uh, uh, precious metals like iridium and platinum. And iridium is not found on Earth in any great amounts. And um, uh, we did the isotopic analysis of uh, various elements from the metallic cores of several of these devices and found out that um, they uh, were made from off-planet material, um, extraterrestrial material. Um, there's a certain pattern of isotopes uh, for each element on Earth, and if, if that pattern is, uh, is varying by more than a percent or so, then it's um, uh, a um, conclusion can be drawn that, it came, that the material came from off-planet. Um, and uh, some of the isotopic ratios and the elements in these um, devices are extremely skewed compared to uh, quite unlike um, uh, the uh, isotopic uh, ratios of elements on Earth. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Koontz, our colleague uh, who's also involved in the research, um, concluded that, that they probably came from um, somewhere else in the galaxy. Uh, they don't even seem to be from our solar system. Uh, these um, devices have uh, carbon nanotube networks inside the metal, um, so um, they're obviously manufactured devices and they seem to be uh, well beyond uh, the technology for, of civilian science at this point. So it's not possible that this something like the nanotubes could it be made through nature? It has to be manufactured? No, they were discovered in 1991 um, in uh, Western science. The Russians discovered them perhaps 10 years before that, um, but uh, they're not known to be found in nature. Um, and uh, certainly not in, uh, in meteorites. Um, so there's no way that it could be faked, really? No, I don't think so. I, it, it, it's, some people have argued that these devices could be made by black government projects, but I, I think that the fact that they contain extraterrestrial material argues strongly against that. So wait, you're saying that this is it was discovered in 1991, right? The, the nano, the nanotubes. Yeah, and many of these objects and date, date, from, before. date from well before the discovery of carbon nanotubes and in, uh, in science on Earth. Um, these um, people were reported uh, that these objects were put in you know, like 30, 40 years before a lot of times. So when you say nanotubes, do you mean that these these things could be used to store information, perhaps? Um, yeah, they they can be made into uh, electronic networks. Um, carbon nanotubes are um, they're um, like. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Graphite is um, a hexagonal array of carbon atoms, and the, these arrays, these layers, are stacked. If you take one of these layers, one of these hex hexagonal arrays of carbon atoms, and roll it up into a tube, that's a carbon nanotube. And uh, there's um, various types of carbon nanotubes with different uh, 
numbers of walls, and single wall are the most uh, studied right now, and these, these contain single wall carbon nanotubes. Single wall carbon nanotubes are um, often less than a nanometer in diameter. These are small diameter single wall carbon nanotubes that are in these devices, and they, those can be used as electronics because there are uh, metallic and semiconducting single wall carbon nanotubes. So you're saying this is very tightly stacked, and if you took out all the, you laid it end to end, it would definitely be a lot larger than it would. So all this information is tightly stored together, compacted? Yeah, I, I would think so, yeah. The, the total length of the carbon nanotubes in one of these things might be several miles. Of, uh, I haven't figured it out, but wow. it's, it's got to be a lot. So the technology used to compact that much information so tightly seems to be pretty futuristic. Definitely. I don't understand how the, uh, the metal could actually be put around the carbon nanotubes uh, without uh, destroying the nanotubes because the, the melting point of these metals is like 1500 degrees Celsius and um, if you poured molten metal over the carbon nanotubes it would just destroy them or uh, convert them to metal carbides. So would it be possible to say that the information required to make one of these carbon nanotubes isn't readily available on Earth? It must well, have come from we somewhere can make, else? We can make carbon nanotubes, but to make, to make a um, 3D intricate composite like this with carbon nanotube electronics inside the metal, that's well beyond our technology at this point. Physio we've speculated that they might be physiological monitoring devices or listening devices. Um, they're definitely relaying information about the subject uh, to uh, the aliens um, through um, radio signals, they're not always transmitting, so... Uh, Have you noticed actual radio signals emitting oh, yeah. from it? We've detected radio signals coming from them, and uh, in two of my reports we outlined some of the frequencies that they give off uh, the last two devices we uh, detected radio signals from. Are they common radio signals that are found on Earth? Uh, some of them are uh, aeronautical and satellite communication frequencies, uh, but um, the, there's also a very high frequency microwave uh, uh, discharge as well. So could it be possibly dangerous to have a lot of microwaves emitting from inside a person? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a lot of microwaves. We've only detected perhaps milliwatt levels of power, um, but um, it's hard to say. I, it's, there's been no uh, ill effects noted from uh, anybody having these uh, devices inside them. What about after the surgery? Has there been they, uh, they don't have um, any rejection or uh, immune response by the body. So that you, it's possible to not even notice these tiny things in your body? Yeah, most people don't notice them at all. Um, so would it be fair to say that on an X-ray? Would it be fair to say that there might be a lot of those in a lot of different type of people? Oh, well, that's very safe to say. Wow. Some of the frequencies that we've been able to gain some knowledge of from uh, from classified information is that they are deep space fixed fixed or mobile deep space frequencies, and that presents quite a conundrum because. Um, one advanced civilization would be using a radio wave to begin with. So do you think it would be possible that the government could know about these nanotube technologies? I think they know about them. I don't think they can reproduce it as yet. It's, um, it's anybody's guess how much technology the Black Project community has. Some of, the, some of their stuff is reverse engineered alien technology reportedly. So would it be possible to take this apart and perhaps learn the secrets of what's inside it and perhaps use it for our own? Technology. That's what we'd like to do at some point. We'd like to uh, take one of these devices and um, uh, do um, mount, it, um, mount it vertically on um, a scanning electron microscope uh, mount and um, take um, an elemental map of uh, one layer of the object then etch away a layer with um, uh, a beam of fast atoms and then uh, do the next layer and get a three-dimensional structure of the object that way. How strong is the object? Is it easy to break? Uh, this one, I don't know. I haven't tried to cut it yet. Um, most of them are fairly easy to break. I've, I've cut, um, I've cut uh, four so far, and three of them are fairly easy to break. One of them was immensely strong and could not be cut at all. With even diamond tools, we could scratch it. It appeared to be some kind of highly advanced uh, iron metal matrix composite with, with carbon nanotubes. You mentioned there was a sort of biological capsule that surrounded it. Would right. that be used to protect it, to prevent it breakage? No, I don't think it's to protect it. I think it's to um, organize the uh, neural input to the device somehow. Is that we, if we were able to uh, back engineer some of the, uh, the technology that we have in these devices, we could prevent, for example, inflammatory processes and rejection. In other words, if we could make something similar, you could wrap a heart, a kidney, a screw, a pin, or wherever, and instill it into the human body, 
and the person would not have to take any anti-rejection medication for the rest of their life. And this was presented in a report, which is in the White House, that I have a copy of from the OSTP. That's the Office of Scientific Technology and Policy. And that was handed to Obama at the time when he was trying to uh, raise money for his uh, medical uh, health care problem to get, a, you know, get Congress to approve the money. Will President Obama, with the help of Congress, fund this medical research and reverse engineer these implants? If so, the implications could help medical technology beyond our imagination. Now, we go to the most incredible account of alien abduction explained by Dr. Roger Lear to Jack Graham. Three young children, about nine or 10 years of age, who lived in Tennessee. And uh, they decided to go out on a little local camping trip. So not too many blocks away, it was kind of like an empty field and so on. So they packed their primitive sort of gear, which was blankets and things of that nature and things to cook over a fire, marshmallows and so on. And they went out and they, they didn't even have a tent. They used sticks, they gathered sticks and they put the blanket over the sticks to act as a, as a tent. And they roasted their marshmallows and told jokes and, and so on. Well, at about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, they noticed that there was a very bright star up ahead, above them. And uh, the three of them all uh, concentrated on this star because it was so bright. And the three of them watched as this star descended closer and closer and closer. And as it got closer, they saw that it was a craft. The next thing that happened was that when the craft was about 50 feet over their heads, a beam of bluish white light and a cone came down over the three of them and they began to levitate up in this cone of light. Now, uh, if someone had done that to me at my age, I'd be have a little bit of trepidation because, you know, if you're going up, in the cone of light, I mean, the first thing that would come to my mind would be the fear of Panic. falling back down. Yeah. You know, there's nothing holding you. But they had, uh, they had the absolute opposite feeling. Oh, wow, this is fun. We're having fun, you know, we're going up in this light. So they get up into the craft, and then they're in a, a round room that kind of uh, looks like a hangar. And uh, there are typical bumper sticker gray beings that are there. And so they say, well, you know, what's, what's happening? Man, what's, what's, what's going on? I said, you know, have no fear. You're going to be returned. You'll be fine. Uh, we're just going to you know, take a look at you folks for a few minutes and so on. But their, their fear was in being separated. Greater fear for each other than for each as an individual. Then when they finally were separated, they were taken down different corridors that went off this room. And under hypnotic regression, is when they described what they saw off the corridors, which were rooms that looked like hospital rooms. And uh, the one that we went through most of the uh, hypnotic regression uh, was placed in a room, unclothed, uh, and placed on a table that he couldn't tell whether it was jutting out of the wall or whether it was on a pedestal. And uh, although he thought it was metallic, it was neither hot nor cold, it was very form-fitting. Uh, but then an instrument was used to, uh, that he described, that actually put the uh, implant in his uh, wrist. And uh, when he did this, uh, he didn't feel too much of anything. But uh, if he got uh, nervous uh, and so on, always one of the gray beings would come very close to him and with their black eyes, they would get very close and look into their eyes and this aura of calmness would come over them. Uh, once this was done, uh, they were uh, examined and taken out and the three kids were back together again in this large uh, hangar-like room. And the next thing they remember, they're lying back on the campsite again. 
and the craft is uh, slowly moving up and bang, it was, it was gone. So uh, they didn't know what to think, or whether they had a nightmare or something happened or you know, just didn't understand the entire situation. One of the things that makes this case so unusual is that all three kids did something very strange after that, like a suggestion was put in their heads or whatever, but they went into, they actually stole into this person's backyard that had a vegetable garden, and they tore up the vegetables and ate them. And that's one of the most unusual cases that I've heard of yet. So they must have been told to, to do this for some reason. Because some folks that are involved in the abduction phenomena come back with symptoms. They feel muscle aches, pain, fatigue, uh, feelings of the flu, dehydration, and so on. But the three kids, and asking them questions, uh, you know, of course they weren't kids when we, we did the surgery, but in asking them, you know, if they had any ill effects from it, uh, they don't recall anything. So maybe that what they got out of the vegetables was something that, um, that uh, obliterated the symptoms that the abductees have. Now what procedures and protocols do you follow for the surgery? Well the procedures and protocols that we follow have to be kept 100 percent in order to make this a scientific study because we try and stay with the scientific method. One of the things we do is when a patient contacts me, they have to convince me that they have an object. And that's either through an x-ray or a CAT scan. We don't accept MRIs because the MRIs can produce false positives for foreign objects. For example, in an MRI, if you're looking uh, through a slice right through the top of a blood vessel and there's blood flowing through a, a vessel, you'll see a nice bright spot. But that's not a foreign object. All it is is a cut through a blood vessel. So if they send me x-rays or a CAT scan, then I take them to the radiologist and I get it confirmed that this is a foreign body. And what is the guesstimation of the material? Is, is it more dense than the surrounding bone? Is it less dense than the surrounding bone? Uh, we know if it's more dense than the surrounding bone, it's probably on the metallic side. Uh, also, we have other consultants that we use, for example, we've had a couple of cases that were dental cases, and uh, these were dental x-rays, so we have uh, dental experts that go ahead and will look at the x-rays and then let them make suggestions as to whether they need further films, a uh, Panorex or a CAT scan. So once it's been established that there is an object there, then the next thing we do is we send that client uh, a package of questions and they have to answer all the questions. There are no right and there are no wrong answers, but it gives us a complete background of what the possibility of their actually being involved with the abduction program is. Also, one of the forms amongst this questionnaire is a, great, is a gradable uh, form on probabilities. So if they're over 35% probable, then they've been involved. Now, lots of people step on things. Lots of people have, uh, you know, they want two seconds of fame on television or to get filmed. There's a lot of reasons for people that uh, contact me. They may be not abductees at all. Uh, some abductees uh, don't get along well with the problems. And as the late John Mack wrote in his book, there are seven traumas that are involved with alien abduction. And only one of them is the event itself. <clears throat> Another one is who are you going to tell? Who are you gonna, yeah. Who's going to believe you? So you have this argument that goes on continuously. So a lot of these people are not well adjusted. A lot of abductees have problems. They can become alcoholics, drug addicts. They can be confined in mental institutions. So uh, 
you, you have to, you know, sift out these people to become part of the study. And this is one of the first things we do. Then once they are accepted as a possible surgical candidate, do they want the surgery? Do they want it removed? And if so, if they agree that they do want it removed, they have to understand that the product that we're going to remove becomes the the ownership becomes part of ANS research, and that we promise to give to the rest of the world as scientific knowledge. And if they're not willing to do that, then there we don't accept them as a patient. So if we look at statistical numbers, you know, let's say 10% out of 100 might be a true surgical candidate. One percent of them will only be ones that we'll operate on. Now have any scientists tried to uh, you know, talk to you and give possible explanations for what it is instead of aliens and try to prove you wrong? Uh, when I talk to the academic scientific uh, community they're also interested in the in the analysis and the intrigue of what they're looking at, at a, on a scientific academic basis uh, that they don't even offer a lot of time suggestions. If we do it and they're being paid, for example, for a television program, they'll actually get them to lie on camera. Uh, also, scientists, uh, by and large, are prey to hire masters as other people you know, and other fields of like occupations do. They have to earn their paycheck. They have to feed their families. So, and they could be threatened. They can be threatened by any agency of the government, for example. Not so much anymore, but in earlier years, yes. To what extent do you think is the government hiding information from us? Do you think they know, do you think they have contact with aliens? I think that the government historically has made contact with aliens and there's most probably been deals that have been made. We, we have enough witnesses now, uh, for example, Holloman Air Force situation in which uh, at Holloman Air Force Base uh, where Air Force One was seen to land, the base was literally frozen, uh, no one could move from their post when this was going on. <laughs> there was lots of witnesses to things that were happening. Two guys, two electricians, up on a uh, pole were told to stay there and not move till all this was over. And that was near the runway. Then they saw three circular craft come flying overhead. Uh, one of them uh, began to hover over the runway when Air Force One stopped. Another one took off and went 20 miles away and hovered over a park. And the third one was somewhere else lingering around. And uh, it was said by the lineman who had a good view of this whole thing that Eisenhower, President Eisenhower at the time, got out of that plane, walked over to the craft, they saw a ramp come down. He walked up the uh, ramp and shook hands with some kind of a non-human wow. being went in, was there for about 20 minutes, came back out again. The uh, craft, uh, alien craft took off. Air Force One took off. And instead of following the rules and regs that they had set up for landings at that base, they took off and flew directly within 50 feet off the roof of the hospital. Jeez. So uh, this, is, this has been, you know, cited as one of the examples, but certain presidents were in the know, certain presidents were not probably in the know. And today, I believe that the situation is totally different. I believe that most of this information today is in the hands of the giant uh, monarchs of industry, these multi uh, lateral country uh, 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 companies that uh, are, you know, some of them are part of the military industrial complex and some of them are industry itself. And it's the greed that keeps propelling this on and on and on. But it looks like they're getting to the point now where they're starting to eat each other because I guarantee you that Standard Oil with its uh, concentration on fossil fuel energy is not really interested in what Monsanto is doing 
making GMO foods. And Monsanto with uh, GMO foods is uh, not really interested in a free energy system that somebody else might develop. So things are changing rapidly. And uh, of course, with the citizen hearing that's going to be held at the end of the month in Washington, D.C., uh, and it will be streamed out to the world, we expect half the population of the world to watch this congressional hearing and hope with hope that the government will actually start releasing information. With trillions of planets in the universe, it's hard to believe that planet Earth is unique. Odds are that life exists elsewhere. And while life on some planets may be less advanced than us, chances are that more advanced life forms will also exist. So the question becomes, will these advanced life forms have the ability to travel to Earth? And if so, secretly tag us with extraterrestrial hardware during their visits? Prior to interviewing Dr. Lear, I might have said no. But while I still have my doubts, Dr. Lear makes a fascinating case for this, and now I'd like to know more. Jack, in his quest for the answer, has reached out to Third Phase of Moon to speak with the alien abductees who've had implants removed by Dr. Roger Lear. We have provided him the contact information. Mary, who wants to remain anonymous, and Tim Cullen have come forward to speak with Jack and answer his questions in regards to their alien abduction and the implants removed by Dr. Roger Lear. Hi, I'm Jack. Tell me about your abduction. I have had my family, it runs in my family. My brother has had experiences. His family, um, since the marriage, has had experiences. Uh, my hu husband underwent experiences, as did I, from being married into my family. <laughs> it seems like that was the protocol for marrying into the family. And because um, I had had unusual experiences from the time I was really, really small, and my brother, too, from the time he was an infant. And I believe they started with my mom and dad because uh, my dad had had some sightings. I had had a sighting. My mother had a sighting of a UFO over our home. Um, it was it ran in the family, and uh, there were a lot of experiences that my husband and I had in um, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And he would actually get night terrors, which we thought were from. Um, is a Vietnam veteran had experiences in Vietnam and thought it was post-traumatic stress syndrome. It turns out it wasn't from Vietnam. He actually then started remembering in the early 90s that the night terrors he was experiencing was from these creatures being in our home and taking us at night. What was your reaction when you realized you had been abducted by extraterrestrials? Let's see, it was removed in 1996. Probably about six months to a year sooner before that, I realized um, I had a scoop mark on my leg. And I did not know there was an implant in there. I had no idea. I just saw this scar on my leg and um, on my left calf. And uh, when Roger was, uh, we had, I was assistant section director and then section director of MUFON for Center of Santa Barbara counties, and Roger was helping me, and he had arranged to do surgeries, and uh, he had gotten funding through Bigelow, and um, for three surgeries, we had we had three people that were going to have supposed implants removed. Roger had gone through the X-ray process and exam process. Well, one of them was Whitley Streber. He had an object in his ear, and he was to be one of our guest speakers, and then go ahead and have a surgery. Last minute, he decided against having the object removed from his ear, and it's on the outside of his ear. He still has it today. Um, it's under the skin on the back of the ear. And uh, he decided against it. Well, we had funding for three surgeries, and Roger was, uh, Dr. Lear was beside himself as to, you know, what was he going to do? And I said, well, you can remove this scar off my leg, this, whatever it is. I don't know how I got it, but make that the third surgery and uh, he he said that's fine he says but we have to go through the examination process we'll need to get x-rays blood tests which we did and on the x-ray um, surprising both to myself and him he saw an object 
on the x-ray that was just under the scar, the scoop mark I had. And that's how we discovered that there was actually an object under the scoop mark. What was your reaction to the news that aliens had implanted a device in you? I was shocked that there was anything under that scoop mark to begin with. I, I didn't know how I obtained that mark, but it was an unusual mark and it appeared, seemed to just appear, at least I just noticed it. Um, I think he was shocked because he, that was the first time he had ever had a scoop mark with an object under it. So he was shocked, I was shocked, and I kept trying to, um, you know, rationalize that, oh, maybe I just got something in my leg, and after it was, you know, extracted and um, examined, it was nothing. I kept saying, are you sure this wouldn't be found in in a regular body, you know, is there any way? And he goes, no, 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 Alice. This would not be found in your lake. It could not, you know, it would not be uh, there naturally by any means. It wasn't a calcification or anything like that. It had a lot of unusual um, characteristics and he's since then done some more um, uh, surgeries that have had uh, the same type of object. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, I think he's, he's, you know, he's doing something that is so important. And he helps so many people. And he never asks for anything, you know, in return from anybody that he, he uh, tries to help. Um, he's just, you know, he's, he's doing it because he has the, not only the ability to do it, but he has the need to find out what is really going on, a curiosity as to what's going on. It's affected him. Everything he does, his life, his career, um, he's very dedicated to trying to find out, you know, what these objects are. And also, with these objects, we're finding that they have uh, no inflammatory um, response around the object. Could this possibly, could this technology help uh, the medical profession now in dealing with transplants where, you know, these people with transplants have to be on horrific medications for many, many years where, you know, if this technology could be developed where um, there would be no rejection. I mean, it would be wonderful for the people that have to go through this with the transplants. So, I mean, he's, he's doing it for a lot of reasons, but he does it. It's a, it's a labor of love for him and curiosity. And he also, he feels very dedicated to trying to help people because a lot of people, you know, they, with these type of situations, they just don't know who to turn to or what to do. Unfortunately, he's there to try to help. Where was your chip implanted? The implant was in the, it was located in my left wrist area, arm wrist area, uh, almost identical to another, uh, another uh, sur the 15th surgery Dr. Lear done on Ron Noel. His implant is the same shape as mine, a cantaloupe seed type object, and located in uh, basically the left wrist area. In fact, uh, we kind of wonder if we can almost put the x-rays over each other and they'd almost be in the same spot. Did it hurt after the surgery? Yeah, when they got a hold of the object, it felt, you know, I felt it a lot of pressure and uncomfortable in my arm. Like it was, you know, got chicken winged and I kind of had to carry it in a sling for a little while, but then it, it calmed down. It really, you know, like I said, it was just, uh, like it was just being, uh, my arm was being abused. I realized this thing was hooked to my nervous system because when I became aware of it, you know, it was like it was aware of me and I was aware of it. The link between the implants and the abductees themselves are questions we may never know. But the real question here is, are we alone? And the answer is, these implants are extraterrestrial in origin. Thanks to young Jack Graham asking the questions and Dr. Roger Lear's answers. We are not alone in the universe. My name is Blake Cousins, and we'll see you again next time. Third.
This is an actual spacecraft from another world, piloted by alien intelligence. One sighting from tens of thousands made over the last 50 years on virtually every continent on the globe. Intelligent life from distant galaxies is now attempting to make open contact with the human race. And tonight, we'll show you the evidence. We celebrate the new Tomorrowland at Walt Disney World in Florida with a television special that's out of this world. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner, head of the Walt Disney Company. In a top secret military installation somewhere in the United States, there are those who believe that the government is hiding the remains of an alien spacecraft that mysteriously crashed to Earth. With more and more scientific evidence of alien encounters and UFO sightings, the idea of creatures from another planet might not be as far-fetched as we once thought. In fact, one of you out there could have the next alien encounter. Enjoy tonight's special. I'm gonna walk over and see if I can sneak a peek. Maybe not. Alien Encounters from New Tomorrowland is brought to you by Bounty. Outstanding absorbency and durability make Bounty the quilted quicker picker-upper. Scientific verification of extraterrestrial life forms routinely arriving on Earth. Top secret reports from ongoing military investigations. Compelling home videos of alien craft captured within the last few months. World figures who have gone public with their own extraterrestrial experiences. The shocking history of government misinformation programs designed to prevent widespread panic and personal accounts of those who have been abducted and studied against their will. It's happened to me, it's happened to my sister, and I believe my mother. My son looks me straight in the eyes, and he says, they took blood out of you, Mama. They don't ask permission, they take you. But it's such an incredible secret, nobody wants to believe it. There is valuable scientific data that would prove once and for all that planet Earth is being visited by highly evolved intelligence that is not from this world. Wait a minute, I've had enough, stop it. From beyond the boundaries of our perceptions, intelligent beings are beckoning mankind to join the galactic community. It's an invitation which is both wondrous and terrifying. This is the nature of alien encounters. Mankind has the unique ability to ignore the obvious, especially when the facts reveal a disturbing truth. We once believed the sun revolved around the Earth. When Galileo demonstrated the reverse is true in 1634, he was charged with heresy and placed under house arrest for the last eight years of his life. The charges were later dropped, 342 years later. Now as we approach a new millennium, Mankind is in the midst of the most profound event in history, actual contact with intelligent life from other planets. For nearly 50 years, officials have been documenting routine alien encounters here on Earth. And thousands of people have seen or experienced this alien presence. Yet many others still refuse to acknowledge the obvious evidence all around them. 
What is it like to be confronted by a creature whose intelligence and skill is far beyond the comprehension of mankind? Would it be enlightening? Would it be an exercise in terror? Or perhaps both? Here in the new Tomorrowland at the Walt Disney World Resort near Orlando, Florida, these concepts are brought to life as guests experience their own alien encounter, a sensory thriller from Disney and George Lucas. We'll give you a sneak preview later in the show. But first, we must prepare you for the future with some shocking insights from the recent past. Alien ships seem to arrive in waves. And if the last few years are any indication, planet Earth is experiencing a tsunami of sightings. Mexico City, 1992. If you were arriving from outer space, this would be your first stop. It's the world's largest metropolitan area, easy to spot from a distance. Saucers arriving here have an affinity for military helicopters. This one was caught stalking a squadron during a national holiday celebration. Dozens of people videotaped the craft. Millions more just stared in disbelief as it covered 200 square miles of territory in a matter of minutes. Canada, 1991. In a residential area just outside Ottawa, this alien ship was photographed landing in what appears to be a prearranged site. UFO investigators claim the structure of this craft reveals a technology previously undocumented. This sighting is known as the Guardian case, named after the pseudonym of the photographer who wishes to keep his identity secret to avoid harassment from local authorities uncomfortable with the notion of alien intruders. For the last few months of 1994 and lately in 1995, Gulf Breeze, Florida has been ground zero for alien encounters. Especially during the day, extraterrestrial craft have become common ornaments in the uneasy skies. Over those dunes, right there. There she is, right there. Oh my God. Residents of Gulf Breeze routinely aim their home video cameras at the horizon. More often than not, they capture an astounding alien display. There it is! Right out there! Looks like an egg on top, an egg on the bottom. You would think these alien sightings would be front page news. So why have they received almost no national attention? The answer is simple. For governments determined to maintain their authority, extraterrestrial contact is pure dynamite. They're beings from another planet. We don't know where they come from. We don't know what they're doing here. There's nothing we can do about it. Meet Captain Kevin Randall, retired Air Force intelligence officer, now a top investigator of alien encounters. Anytime a technologically superior civilization comes in contact with a technologically inferior civilization, the technologically inferior civilization ceases to exist. Not necessarily through conquest, not necessarily through invasion, but because the technology changes the underlying social structures of that civilization and it uh, disintegrates. Those fears are reflected in a 1960 federally funded study by the Brookings Institution, which warned that public knowledge of alien life could cause civilization to collapse. So they began a policy of covering up and hiding the information, but they also began a policy of ridiculing, so that people who really see something are afraid to come forward. This isn't right to do the ridicule. I mean, a lot of people suffer. Retired Army officer Clifford Stone certainly suffered after he began private research into the UFO phenomena while still in the service. Well, I was given a lawful order while I was in the military to back off. I refused that lawful order. That resulted in me having to go to be psychoanalyzed, which kind of backfired on my command. But I was actually given a lawful order not to write to members of Congress without first getting it approved through my command and not to uh, talk to members of the media. Of course, I went out and violated all those directives simply because I felt they had no right, that I had a right. 
he also has determination. This collection of classified government documents represents years of determined effort by Stone to open the UFO files and offer fresh leads to investigators on the trail of the truth. It is not surprising that this book is making top military officials very uncomfortable. I think that some of the underlying concerns they have is the impact it will have on society as a whole if the information is ever released. Then why have aliens chosen to visit our small blue planet hidden on the distant fringes of an insignificant star cluster? Well, we invited them here. When we return, what is attracting alien visitors to planet Earth? Extraterrestrials take aim on America's military. A crashed saucer becomes a top secret bombshell. The nation's capital becomes a cosmic crossroads. And later, how Disney Imagineers have designed a way to prepare humans for their inevitable alien encounter. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, and a fire enfolding itself, and the brightness was about it. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Ezekiel chapter 1. There have been reports of alien encounters throughout recorded history, often buried in the obscure poetry of mystics. But since the end of World War II, alien encounters have adopted a darker, more menacing demeanor. No longer just spirited lights dancing in the sky, UFOs turn more brazen, announcing themselves with surprising ferocity. Most alien activity on Earth in this century seems to have been sparked by the single most profound technological achievement in human history. The atomic bomb did more than blow away every conventional notion of combat. It also saddled mankind with the awesome responsibility of life and death for the entire planet. But what the world didn't know in 1945 was that the atomic bomb's brilliant burst of energy would also be mankind's cosmic calling card, announcing to the universe that a technological society had evolved on a small blue planet in the backwaters of the stars. So as the world celebrated the war's end in 1945, aliens who heard man's atomic trumpet we're already charting their course towards Earth, responding to our open invitation. As early as 1947, the large alien ships began to arrive, navigated by living creatures. Their advanced physics allowed them to transverse the galaxy and pierce Earth's atmosphere with amazing speed. The U.S. military immediately went on the alert against the unknown menace. Sightings were perceived as threats to the security of an America still reeling from the edgy consciousness of war. And the sightings were taking place all across the country. I glanced up and there were three flying saucers in a V with uh, what appeared to be a dome on the top with, I can't be sure, but I believe I saw the sun glinting off of uh, our windows or observation portals of sort. I think it was from outer space friendly. Army fighter planes are on patrol for flying saucers. Cameras installed to photograph them. Fort on Oregon, the area from which came the first weird reports. This flying saucer patrol shows how the Air Forces, while not putting too much stock in the mysterious things in the sky, are investigating. The control top... They are a lamp-shaped day with black, dark eyes. That's the best way I can describe them. And there's about seven or eight of them. Officers nearby said they saw a light in the sky. And Alan Godfrey insists his encounter was genuine. I know that night what I saw was real. 
It was dumb real. In 1974, in Landrithlow, Wales, residents felt severe tremors. Tremors, which some felt were not naturally caused. And I don't think it was an earthquake, Samuel. You know, I still think it wasn't an earthquake. John Roberts wasn't the only one shaken that day. Hugh Edwards thought he saw a flying saucer. I saw this object come in along the mountain, with the size of a bus, really. Uh, it's right in the middle, these little ends. Came, came across the mountain, towards the road there. I just went over there. It dipped, and I thought it was going to crash. It dipped out of sight into the valley. Well, I'd heard so much about flying saucers, and I thought, well, this is it. The only sound I heard of it, like, like uh, going through the air. I was very surprised to see it, really. The district nurse thought, perhaps, a plane was down. I thought there might be an air crash. Maybe, as a nurse, we could help giving first aid. So I called to my daughters, and we got into the car, and we made our way up to the mountain. We drove a fair way along the mountain road, and to our left, we could see a huge orange ball sitting on the mountain, glowing. Yeah, we stopped and we started looking what we thought was going to be an aircraft yeah. on fire. So we'd envisage sort of, oh God, you know, there might be bodies if it was an aeroplane crash and we weren't too happy at that prospect, but we were quite surprised to see this big reddish orange ball just sitting there. There were no flames and it was so um, uniform, the shape the round spherical shape of it made us realize we weren't looking at an aircraft um, there were no flames jumping but it was it was pulsating this red orange object that we saw and we could see little lights like fairy lights coming towards the object in a zigzag pattern and we assumed at that time possibly there was someone going to see what was what with hindsight, we realised so, well, the search party couldn't have got there, located it and got there in the time it had taken us to go from the village up to the, the mountain. mountain. Yeah. No one could have organised themselves to get to the object that we saw. Since no search party went out that night, nothing was ever found at the scene. But astronomer Ron Madison has proposed that what the villagers saw that night was a meteorite or fireball and that it coincided with an earthquake at a nearby fault. Thinking that that explosion might well have been due to an impacting piece of rock, our first reaction was to try to estimate the energy involved. And it seemed to us to be something that would correspond to an explosion of the size of about 600 tons of TNT. <laughs> got letters from as far apart as Penzance and Northern Ireland and Derby, all reporting seeing a bright light, maybe comparable with a half moon in brilliance, moving across the sky at the speed of an aircraft but with no sound, and uh, trailing uh, smoke just like you would expect something on fire to be crashing. In the next few days, we were to realize, of course, that the village was not very far from the Bala Fort, which is active and has been moving steadily over thousands of years. And unbeknown to us at the time, originally, there had been on that evening a movement on the fault, and that is incontrovertible evidence. 
this was a coincidence. There were fireballs in the sky at the same time that there was a triggered movement along the Balafort. Another highly publicized British sighting proved equally attributable to natural causes, but not before many believed that they too had seen a UFO. In March 1981, policeman Derek Ingram saw and photographed what many thought to be an alien craft that had landed on a fell or hillside. I was in the uh, kitchen of the police house at Craco. I looked out across the fell with the kitchen window back onto the fell and I saw a very intense bright light, a big band of light on the rock face of the fell. I watched the light for maybe 10 minutes and I thought it was worth taking a photograph of it, it was un unusual. I actually drove up onto the hill and walked across the fell to try and find something on there, maybe something had been dropped or something had happened. Uh, there was nothing up there, I, I couldn't find anything at all that would explain the lights. The faithful saw a thin craft with three lights. And as the press had a field day, researchers tried to identify the visitors. After the photographs had been taken, the, the negatives were given to the Yorkshire UFO Society, who spent two years investigating the case, and they sent the negatives to Graham Saucer Watch in America and to a very well-known German UFO photographic analyst. Neither groups of people could come up with a satisfactory explanation, and in fact, Grand Social Watch actually said snow was the best possibility for it. In 1983, the Yorkshire UFO Society went public with the case and actually claimed that it was the best evidence yet for a structured craft being sighted in, in the British Isles. The investigation continued, and in 1987, we'd almost given up hope of ever finding out what caused it, and I was on a, a weekend trip in the Dales with my wife and son and decided to stop and show them Kirk fell. And lo and behold, what should be staring back at me from the cliff face, but the Krico UFO. What they found was certainly a surprise. Right, we're about 1,100 feet up a Yorkshire cliff, and this is the Krico UFO. It might not look like much from close up, but you can actually see the three balls of light on the photograph. They're created there, there, and there by a complicated illusion, uh, a mixture, in fact, of white lichen, green lichen, the Yorkshire Gritstone Rock, which contains quartz crystals, and the rainwater. All this, when it's illuminated at certain angles by rain or damp, it gives the illusion of three balls of light. Some days it can be very bright, some days it can be very dull. On the day in particular when Derek Ingram saw it, it was amazingly bright. Um, and that's what created uh, the feeling in him that he'd actually seen something totally unusual, even though he'd actually looked out of his window probably every day for the previous two years and not seen it. Though some sightings can clearly be explained by natural phenomena, UFOs continue to have a grip on the public's imagination that is not easily loosened. And there's no shortage of pranksters to capitalize on this fascination. In Gulf Breeze, Florida, in November of 1987, Builder Ed Walters claims he took Polaroids of a UFO three times as big as a house. For him, it was just one of many such photo opportunities, near abductions and glimpses of aliens. Though he sold two books worth, Ed would not allow his photos to be included in this program. such as these are not difficult to fake with a little know-how, a styrofoam model, and the right camera. It was quite easy to reproduce these pictures. He took the majority of his early pictures, about 30 pictures, uh, on a Polaroid 108 camera. It is very easy to double expose the film in that camera. If you don't pull the film out, 
you can press the button and expose that same piece of film again. You take a picture of the UFO model inside, you go outside, take a picture of the skyline, let the film develop, there you have your double exposure of a UFO flying in the sky. Still, Walters has his disciples, and photoanalyst Bruce McAbee is one of them. A government research physicist, McAbee is a believer in UFOs and is the author of many scientific papers on them. I have analyzed all the uh, films and videos that have been taken by Ed Walters. I have uh, studied um, most of the videos, I guess, that have been taken by other people down there. And it's just sitting there. As far as Ed's pictures and videos are concerned, it's my opinion that they are real. I've analyzed these very carefully, taking into account all the uh, criticisms that have been leveled against them and have found reasons to reject the criticisms. In baseball, you get three strikes and you're out. For Ed Walters, in this case, strike one was when a model was found in the attic of his former home. Strike two was when a young man named Tommy Smith came forward and claimed that he was an eyewitness to Ed Walters creating double exposed UFO pictures. Strike three was when we went out and did photo experiments and were able to replicate many of these photos, especially the difficult photos like the UFO hovering over the road. So my conclusion is three strikes and you're out. We um, published the first pictures of the Gulf Breeze sightings back in uh, November of 1987. And uh, I was uh, trying to figure out exactly how to present them because I tried to run everything that happened locally in Gulf Breeze. Uh, when my folks came in and uh, I said, you're not going to believe what we're getting ready to run the paper this week. And I showed them the pictures. And they said, that's what we saw. It was primarily because of uh, the many other people in Gulf Breeze that witnessed the UFO, both the same night that Ed first got the pictures and many times after that, that uh, the Sentinel continued to carry the story. I have had three other daylight sightings and over a hundred sightings at night at Shoreline Park in Gulf Breeze. I witnessed over 170 sightings. These were red lights, red and white lights, over and around Gulf Breeze, Florida. I've seen a silver flying dome in the sky that was unidentifiable. Never seen anything like that before, and it was just, it was unexplainable. But just across the bay from Gulf Breeze is the Pensacola Naval Air Base. One explanation that occurs to locals is that some of the sightings are illegal pranks by naval personnel at the base. Another possibility is that actual military craft are being confused with UFOs. For instance, would most people recognize UAVs, uninhabited aerial vehicles, designed for stealthy reconnaissance and secret observation? Yet despite the fact that certain sightings may be hoaxes or otherwise explained by natural or man-made phenomena, we keep on looking. Our fascination only grows as scientists uncover evidence of life on other planets. It only grows as it becomes increasingly reasonable to believe we are not alone in the universe. If signs of life on Mars prove true, extraterrestrial life in general may be even more widespread. Astronomers calculate the number of civilizations we can expect to detect in space. They use the Drake Equation. Professor Frank Drake. The first factor is the rate of star formation in our galaxy. Obviously, the more stars you make, the more potential abodes of life there will be. 
Some fraction of those stars will have planets. That's the second factor, the fraction which have planets. We then have to take into account the number of planets in each system which are potential abodes of life. The next factor is the fraction of systems of living things which give rise to intelligence. The next factor is the fraction of systems of intelligent creatures which develop high technology, detectable technology. But how long do they last? How long are they detectable? Perhaps they're destroyed by cosmic accidents. Perhaps uh, in an ugly way through nuclear war. More likely, we think they become undetectable because they become so sophisticated in their technology that they don't waste any energy. They don't release energy into space and therefore there's no sign of them to detect. And so we say, well, there must be some longevity, L the length of time typically a civilization is visible. And now if we take the rate of production and multiply by that L, the end result is that thing we started out to find, which is the number of detectable civilizations in space. And the number is getting bigger. Seven new planets have been discovered in the last year. One planet is almost as big as Jupiter, by the fourth star nearest to the Sun, a planet orbiting star 51 in the constellation of Pegasus. The latest estimate of the number of galaxies is now 50 billion. The estimated number of detectable civilizations, 100 million million. Are any of these potential civilizations attempting to communicate with us? SETI the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is listening. I made the first modern radio search in 1960. All over the world, large radio telescopes were being constructed because the, the beauty and power of radio astronomy had just been recognized. And also at that time, some very much more sensitive radio receivers were invented combination of these new telescopes and these new radio receivers gave us a sensitivity very much greater than we've had before. And this was a first. We had, in our abilities, crossed a very important threshold. So it made sense to search. It didn't require anything special in the activities of the extraterrestrials. If they were just like us, we could detect them. Conducting a SETI search from the Earth's surface uh, is very challenging and very difficult. And the reason is you detect intelligent signals all the time. It's just they're all from us. All from us. And some with an impressive shelf life. Call sign GBTT. Gulf Bravo Tango Tango. Over 30 years after it was first sent, a coded wartime signal intended for the Queen Mary was received by its successor, the QE-2. The QE-2 uses the same call sign. The signal came out was addressed to Gulf Bravo Tango Tango, which is the call sign of the QE-2, but it was signal letters of the Queen Mary. And the radio officer who received the signal recognized the Gulf Bravo Tango Tango and thought it was for this ship but in reality when he received it he realized it was a wartime signal which had obviously been bouncing around in space for 30 odd years. Sent to the Queen Mary in the 40s the signal arrived in February 1978. Was it bouncing through space as Captain Arnott suggested or somehow intercepted and sent by someone or something we have yet to identify. Have we ever detected an intelligent signal from another world? Jerry Amon may have. Straight from a fixed source near the center of the galaxy to Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope. A telescope larger than three football fields.
we had started a data run on August 15, 1977, that lasted for about three days. As I was looking through the printout, I was recording and marking all of those signals that were unusually strong, and I came across one that was stronger than I'd ever seen before by many times. And I was so astonished that I wrote the word wow, exclamation point, over the margin without even thinking. To have signals coming in only one channel indicates the possibility that this was some either unique astronomical event or that it was generated by some transmitter. We are resurveying the sky using more modern equipment and we have passed through that same region of the sky and have not seen the wild source again. Eamon and his associates checked their equipment and their figures. Studies eliminated glitches, space probes and terrestrial sources. We have ruled out effectively uh, nearby spacecraft or space debris or satellites in Earth orbit, and we've certainly ruled out anything close, very close to the radio telescope, like an airplane flying through the, the beam of the telescope. Uh, we have not ruled out the possibility that this is actually a signal from extraterrestrial intelligence. The transmission of a signal is one thing. But are there ways to travel these vast distances of space? If you imagine this balloon is our universe, we live in three dimensions in the surface of the balloon. And it has been suggested that there may be what are called wormholes, that if you like, sort of run across the balloon from one side to the other, or connecting points, um, which would allow us to travel from one side of the balloon via a shortcut to the other side of the balloon. Imagine that the, this sheet of paper is our universe and we're at point A and we want to go to point B. Normally we would have to travel through from A to B through the universe. What would be nice, of course, would be if we could find some way of bending the universe in another dimension to bring those two points together and then step across the gap. Um, and that's a, a sort of space warp, if you like, warping the universe to bring those points closer together. As yet, the answer remains theoretical. For now, we are limited to sending craft into nearby space to gather information, capture images, and measure conditions. Could others be doing that too? With that question, we return to our fascination with something larger, something other. We return to our fascination as we continue to face the sky. Phase of Moon. My name is Blake Cousins. In this groundbreaking documentary, we're going to explore alien abduction and strange implants extracted from people from around the world. Dr. Roger Lear has performed 16 surgeries and has removed 17 implants that are extraterrestrial in origin. We'll show you the objects he's removed and reveal why they are described as a smoking gun that prove that visitors from other planets are routinely visiting Earth and keeping tabs on the inhabitants. Also, we'll be speaking to alien abductees and patients of Dr. Roger Lear who've had alien implants removed from their bodies. 15-year-old Jack Graham will be our special correspondent on location in Los Angeles asking Dr. Roger Lear the questions if we are alone in the universe. As one of the most eloquent and intelligent investigators of extraterrestrial life, we'll hear Dr. Lear's observations on why the aliens are interested in our planet and what their plan is for the human race. Now where in the body do most implants usually come from? 
Well, that's an interesting question of where we find them in the body. Uh, what we've come to the conclusion is that they have to be in areas that are relatively superficial and near a bone. We've never found one in a body cavity such as the thorax or the abdomen or the brain. Now, we've also come to the conclusion that maybe this is necessary because the electronics of the mechanism, we found that this may be necessary because it's broadcasting a signal. And when you broadcast a signal, you, at least according to human technology, you have to have an antenna. And what better antenna could be than the skeleton of the body? It contains all the minerals necessary for an antenna. So perhaps that's why they're in such association with bone. The other aspect of it is if you're doing millions of these and you're doing them all over the world, and there's a large number of abductees with Oprah Paul in 1993, 1996, said that at least 2% of the American population is involved in alien abduction. And that was a conservative poll because there's a lot of people who are not going to want to answer these questions at all. And then if you multiply that by the world's population, you're talking about a lot of people. So uh, to get remote information as to what is going on within the human body, like we, we tag bears, I mean, we tag porpoises and uh, whales and so on, and we can study their, their habits, uh, how long a bear hibernates, you know, what their metabolism is during the winter time and so on. Even John Glenn, our astronaut, complained on national television that he had to swallow implants because mission control had to have that, you know, physiological information. Now, well, one of the things that we haven't talked about at all is why are implants there in the first place? Now, why exactly do you think that implants are necessary? Well, I think, again, based on human logic, and let's say, you know, uh, the human race is in a state of infancy, because we haven't been around that long. A race that may be hundreds, thousands, or maybe millions of years older than we are may not use the same logic as we do. So the answer I'm going to give you is based on our human logic. It looks like to me that the entire human race is being genetically re-manipulated again. Because if you look at the children born within the last 60, 75 years, they are not the same human as a person who was my age. In fact, uh, a gentleman by the name of John White, who used to put on UFO conferences in the state of Connecticut, years ago came up, recognized this, and he came up with the term homo noeticus, instead of homo sapien, homo noeticus, and that means new human. If you listen to what a child has to say today, and ask them or get a feeling for where they get their knowledge from. It's not from a book. It's not from TV. It's not off the computer. They already know it. It's a different kind of human being. So if you're doing a genetic manipulation on a population, you might want to know exactly what's going on genetically without having to abduct the individual again. So you would do it remotely, like as I stated previously with what we do with lesser animals. Now, would you, for example, reach into uh, the ocean and pull out a fish and tell the fish, I'm going to put a tag on you so I can know what your swimming habits are or what you eat? No, they would just pull, we would pull the fish out, do our thing, put them back. We do it with manatees. I just watched Animal Planet this morning. The, the, the manatee doesn't know they have a broadcasting device. We don't explain it to them that we want to learn about their metabolism and their eating habits and so on. So they just do it. Well, that's, you know, kind of what they're doing with us. They put these uh, devices in so that possibly they can gain remote information without ever having to come back and abduct us again. 
Now, which is another interesting thing. I've been asked, well, how come I can take them out? Do, do aliens want it to be found? Do the, well, you know, that, that's a good question. Do aliens want it to be found? And if they, if they didn't, I guess I wouldn't be taking them out. You know, and then I get asked, well, who else is doing this? And as far as I know, I'm the only person in the world. And I did research, you know, prior to the time I did the first one, even though I thought it was going to be a funny, funny joke, joke, joke. I wanted to see how many implants were taken out previously. And all I did was I read through the UFO literature and I saw that things were taken out. They turned to powder, they disappear, they dropped, they did this, they did that, but nobody ever came up with anything. And so I do cases and I come up with actual physical objects that can be sent to material scientific laboratories and get opinions. I mean, you know, I, I can't explain that. That's, that's strange. And if somebody had told me, you know, 50 years ago, that I would ever be doing anything like this, or would have traveled to 42 countries, or have done the things that I've done, or have done the television programs and radio programs I've done, I would have told them they were nuts. Now, I know you've uh, removed many implants. How similar are the implants to one another? Are they each clones of themselves? Or do they vary? <laughs> well, the implants that we have removed uh, in the past, we have about seven that look exactly the same. And if you line them all up on gauze sponges, you would never tell one from the other. We have a few that are, are different, but I have synthetically divided them into three categories. Ones that are metallic and covered with a biological coating, ones that are non-metallic, and one that is biological. And uh, each uh, operates a little bit differently. But the ones, the seven that we have that are metallic rods with biological coatings are virtually all the same. Now, do you personally believe that you've been contacted by aliens? Uh, I would have to say uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, I can tell you an episode that occurred with uh, my family, my daughter and myself. Uh, in Laughlin some years ago, which I wrote a book, uh, I wrote a part of a book called Chop Liver, and we talked about that incident, but um, during the awards banquet that we were having at the conference, uh, I was asked to come outside with my family, so there was a lot of people who were lined up at the, uh, at the fence along the uh, Colorado River. And I, we were in back of a, a lady in a white dress, and I said, what, what's going on? What's happening here? She said, oh, you missed them, you missed them. There was about seven of them out here. And I said, seven what? She said, seven craft. Wow. And I said, oh, well, and I started looking around, and I didn't see anything. And, you know, if you start staring at objects in the heavens, uh, the, your eye muscles begin to twitch, and... I thought, well, you know, these people are having what's called nocturnal nystigmas is the word for it. And then suddenly, uh, like in the movie, A Beautiful Mind, where you can look up at the heavens and you can find any, uh, any geometric uh, concentration of stars that you want to see. There's, there's thousands, millions of them there. You know, so we, our attention was called to a triangle of stars. Now there was a big, bright, full moon, really bright. And right below the moon was this triangle of stars and the, the, all 40 people seemed to be concentrating on this triangle of stars. And then suddenly the bottom two stars started to move and they came downward and they went into a pair and they slowly went towards the corona of the moonlight and disappeared. And uh, at the same time, I think everyone there got a telepathic message. Yes, we're here. Believe it. Bye-bye. And my daughter, who was about 12 years old at the time, said, Dad, are those folks coming back again? So, yes, I, I believe I have been contacted by non-terrestrial beings. Now, what would you say is the most credible argument you've ever heard for abduction? 
well, the most credible, credible argument that I've heard for abduction in the cases that we've done surgery on uh, would be very hard to delineate because when we set up our set of criteria and protocols, uh, the individual must have some kind of a memory of being associated with the abduction phenomena. When, when Bob Bigelow or NIDS decided to take on this, this responsibility of doing the metallurgy, I had to do some studying so that I could just interpret what they had to say. And I got, so we started getting reports back and uh, the first report we got back was the, was, they were comparing, this was Los Alamos National Laboratory. They were comparing these to meteorite samples. Wow. Well, we know if somebody didn't step on a meteorite or get one whacked through the back of his hand, it wouldn't so have happened. So it has to come from outer space. It had to come from outer space, and they're calling them meteorite samples. So that was rather mind-blowing. So that was the beginning of the scientific aspect. So I figured, well, you know, if we're going to carry on with this, we better set up some scientific protocols and criteria for doing this kind of work. Uh, and then we formed our 501c3 nonprofit organization, ANS Research, and uh, no charges were then ever made to um, any of the surgical candidates. I see. Now, I know, because you've written a lot of books, clearly, most people must have heard about them. How many people ask you, can you inspect me and see if I have any alien implants inside my body? Do you get a lot of emails per day? Well, I get a tremendous amount of emails, so sometimes 3,500 a day. Wow. <laughs> and uh, yes, we have now instituted a methodology, a scientific methodology, for looking at the possibilities of whether somebody might have an object in their body. <laughs> and Steve uh, and I both have uh, equipment that we can go, for example, to a conference. Let's say, you know, tomorrow an alien reveals himself to the general public. How would you say people would react? Would there be mayhem and riots, or how would it go? Well, if the alien presence were known uh, suddenly, you know, one day. For example, I always I like to use the example of a huge uh, multi-football field alien craft <laughs> landing on a busy freeway during rush hour. Would there be a panic? Uh, the answer is yes, there would be a panic because people would be on their cell phones calling Caltrans to see how long they were going to have to sit there before that thing got out of the way so they could go back to get home to watch the Lakers game. But see, it just indicates the, the quality of life that we have here in the United States. Probably the least important thing of uh, an, an individual who lives in the United States, at least, uh, is uh, extraterrestrial beings. As long as it doesn't interfere with you personally, then it could be fine, or it could be not fine, or who, who cares? But because that relationship has been made fun of for so many years, well, we don't even take it, uh, the common uh, person doesn't even take it seriously. So the world is changing, and the world has got to know, finally know, the truth. You know, uh, government sources and private industry has taken over most of the knowledge of, you know, the extraterrestrial presence. Yeah. I guess, do you have any good guesses as to why aliens would contact us? You know, what, what, makes, uh, what makes us stand out that aliens would want to put their implants inside of us? Well, I think in order to understand what the alien approach is to human life on Earth, we have to have a good understanding of our history, which we don't and which nobody seems to care about except a few. But if you go back and you look at ancient history and you look at ancient paintings and wood carvings and so on, even liturgical paintings with Jesus, you're going to look up and you're going to see a typical saucer UFO craft flying around even back in those days. So, you know, we don't know where we came from. We've been looking for the missing link for year after year after year. Where's the missing link? If we look at the writings of uh, Zachariah Sitchin, the late Zachariah Sitchin just passed away, 
Um, and he wrote a set of books called The Earth Chronicles. And he says that 435,000 years ago, from another planet in our solar system called Nibiru, the uh, group or uh, race of individuals called the Anunnaki came here and their head geneticist, whose name was Enki, manipulated what was already here into human beings. Wow. So if we don't understand the history of, of uh, where we came from in the first place, how can we possibly understand that the present or the future of where we're going with all this? Jack Graham will now speak to Stephen Colburn, chemist and material scientist, in regards to the implants removed by the alien abductees. So, can you tell me a bit about yourself and your role within this program? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Steve Colburn. I'm a material scientist. Um, I was educated at UCLA, and um, I uh, work in Camarillo, just a few blocks from where uh, Dr. Lear works. And um, uh, after we met, um, uh, we decided to have a collaboration on uh, analyzing these objects more thoroughly. Um, a lot of the objects that you've removed had not been analyzed um, adequately, so. Um, uh, I have uh, done a lot of uh, microscopy and um, elemental analysis on these objects and uh, come up with some interesting findings. Um, one thing we found out is that um, the devices are definitely nanotechnological, uh, <laughs> nanotechnological devices. Um, they're not just simply uh, metallic objects that somehow got into the body. Um, they contain carbon nanotube electronics and carbon nanotubes are the field I'm working in in my, my regular job. Um, and uh, they give off radio signals um, and um, they have uh, odd nanostructures in them made of carbon nanotubes. Uh, carbon nanotube electronics are a hot uh, topic in material science today. Um, by the way, there's many amazing properties about them. The aliens have apparently perfected the technology to use carbon nanotubes in these devices. And um, uh, there are proprioceptor nerves that, that um, go into these, uh, the tissue capsule or a gray uh, membrane around these devices. And um, one, of the, one of the most fascinating findings was that, um, that these devices contain, uh, many of them contain meteoric iron uh, from the, um, fitting from the trace element pattern of um, gallium, germanium, uh, uh, precious metals like iridium and platinum. And iridium is not found on Earth in any great amounts. And um, uh, we did the isotopic analysis of uh, various elements from the metallic cores of several of these devices and found out that um, they uh, were made from off-planet material, um, extraterrestrial material. Um, there's a certain pattern of isotopes uh, for each element on Earth, and if, if that pattern is, uh, is varying by more than a percent or so, then it's um, uh, a... Um, the conclusion can be drawn that, it came, that the material came from off-planet. Um, and uh, some of the isotopic ratios and the elements in these um, devices are extremely skewed compared to uh, quite unlike um, uh, the uh, isotopic uh, ratios of elements on Earth. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Koontz, our colleague uh, who's also involved in the research, um, concluded that, that they probably came from um, somewhere else in the galaxy. They don't even seem to be from our solar system. Uh, these um, devices have uh, carbon nanotube networks inside the metal. Um, so um, they're obviously manufactured devices and they seem to be uh, well beyond uh, the technology for, of civilian science at this point. So it's not possible that this something like the nanotubes could have been made through nature. It has to be manufactured. No, they were discovered in 1991 um, in uh, Western science. The Russians discovered them perhaps 10 years before that, um, but uh, they're not known to be found in nature, um, and uh, certainly not in, uh, in meteorites. Um, so there's no way that it could be faked, really? No, I don't think so. I, 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 some people have argued that these devices could be made by black government projects, but I. I think that the fact that they contain extraterrestrial material argues strongly against that. So what you're saying that this is, it was discovered in 1991, right, the, the nano, the nano Yeah, and many of these objects and date, date, from, from date from well before the discovery of carbon nanotubes and in, uh, in science on Earth. Um, these um, people reported uh, that these objects were put in, in you know, 30, 40 years before a lot of times. So when you say nanotubes, do you mean that these, these things could be used to store information, perhaps? 
Um, yeah, they they can be made into uh, electronic networks. Um, carbon nanotubes are um, they're um, like uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Graphite is um, a hexagonal array of carbon atoms, and the, these arrays, these layers, are stacked. If you take one of these layers from these hex hexagonal arrays of carbon atoms and roll it up into a tube, that's a carbon nanotube. And uh, there's um, various types of carbon nanotubes with different uh, numbers of walls. And single wall are the most uh, studied right now, and these, these contain single wall carbon nanotubes. Single wall carbon nanotubes are um, often less than a nanometer in diameter. These are small diameter single wall carbon nanotubes that are in these devices, and they, those can be used as electronics because there are uh, metallic and semiconducting single wall carbon nanotubes. So you're saying this is very tightly stacked, and if you took out all the, if you laid it end to end, it would definitely be a lot larger than it would. So all this information is tightly stored together, compacted? Yeah, I, I would think so, yeah. The, the total length of the carbon nanotubes in one of these things might be several miles. Of, uh, I haven't figured it out, but wow. it's, it's got to be a lot. So the technology used to compact that much information so tightly seems to be pretty futuristic. Definitely. I don't understand how the, uh, the metal could actually be put around the carbon nanotubes uh, without uh, destroying the nanotubes because the, the melting point of these metals is like 1500 degrees Celsius and um, if you poured molten metal over the carbon nanotubes it would just destroy them or uh, convert them to metal carbides. So would it be possible to say that the information required to make one of these carbon nanotubes isn't readily available on Earth? It must well, have come from we somewhere can make, else? We can make carbon nanotubes, but to, ma to make a um, 3D intricate composite like this with carbon nanotube electronics inside the metal, that's well beyond our technology at this point. Physio we speculate that there, they might be physiological monitoring devices or listening devices. Um, they're definitely relaying information about the subject uh, to uh, the aliens um, through um, radio signals, they're not always transmitting, so... Uh, Have you noticed actual radio signals emitting oh, yeah. from it? We detect radio signals coming from them, and uh, in two of my reports we outlined some of the frequencies that they give off. Uh, the last two devices we uh, detected radio signals from. Are they common radio signals that are found on Earth? Uh, some of them are uh, aeronautical and satellite communication frequencies, uh, but um, the, there's also a very high frequency microwave uh, uh, discharges as well. So could it be possibly dangerous to have a lot of microwaves emitting from inside a person? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a lot of microwaves. We only detected perhaps milliwatt levels of power, um, but um, it's hard to say. Was, there have been no uh, ill effects noted from uh, anybody having these uh, devices inside them. What about after the surgery? Has it they, uh, they don't have um, any rejection or uh, immune response by the body. So that you, it's possible to not even notice these tiny things in your body? Yeah, most people don't notice them at all. Um, so would, would it be fair to say that them on an X-ray? Would it be fair to say that there might be a lot of those in a lot of different type of people? Oh, well, that's very safe to say. Wow. Some of the frequencies that we've been able to gain some knowledge of from, uh, from classified information is that they are deep space fixed, fixed or mobile deep space frequencies. And that presents quite a conundrum because. Um, what advanced civilization would be using radio wave to begin with. So do you think it would be possible that the government could know about these nanotube technologies? I think they know about them. I don't think they can reproduce it as yet. But, um, it's anybody's guess how much technology the Black Project community has. Some of, the, some of their stuff is reverse engineered alien technology reportedly. So would it be possible to take this apart and perhaps learn the secrets of what's inside it and perhaps use it for our own? Technology. That's what we'd like to do at some point. We'd like to uh, take one of these devices and um, uh, do um, mount it um, mounted vertically on um, a scanning electron microscope uh, mount and um, take um, an elemental map of one layer of the object, then etch away a layer with um, uh, a beam of fast atoms, and then uh, do the, the next layer and get a three dimensional structure of the object that way. How strong is the object? Is it easy to break? Uh, this one, I don't know. I haven't tried to cut it yet. Um, most of them are fairly easy to break. I've, I've cut, um, I've cut uh, four so far, and three of them are fairly easy to break. One was immensely strong and could not be cut at all. With even diamond tools, we could scratch it. It appeared to be some kind of highly advanced uh, iron metal matrix composite with, car with carbon nanotubes. You mentioned there was a sort of biological capsule that surrounded it. Would right. that be used to protect it, to prevent it breakage? No, I don't think it's to protect it. I think it's to um, organize the uh, neural input to the device somehow. 
is that we, if we were able to uh, back engineer some of the, uh, the technology that we have in these devices, we can prevent, for example, inflammatory processes and rejection. In other words, if we could make something similar, you could wrap a heart, a kidney, a screw, a pin, or wherever, and instill it into the human body, and the person would not have to take any anti-rejection medication for the rest of their life. So, and this was presented in a report, which is in the White House, that I have a copy of, from the OSTP. That's the Office of Scientific Technology and Policy. And that was handed to Obama at the time when he was trying to uh, raise money for his uh, medical uh, health care problem to get, a, you know, get Congress to approve the money. Will President Obama, with the help of Congress, fund this medical research and reverse engineer these implants? If so, the implications could help medical technology beyond our imagination. Now, we go to the most incredible account of alien abduction explained by Dr. Roger Lear to Jack Graham. Three young children, about nine or 10 years of age, who lived in Tennessee. And uh, they decided to go out on a little local camping trip. So not too many blocks away, it was kind of like an empty field and so on. So they packed their primitive sort of gear, which was blankets and things of that nature and things to cook over a fire, marshmallows and so on. And they went out and they, they didn't even have a tent. They used sticks, they gathered sticks and they put the blanket over the sticks to act as a, as a tent. And they roasted their marshmallows and told jokes and, and so on. Well, at about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, they noticed that there was a very bright star up ahead, above them. And uh, the three of them all uh, concentrated on this star because it was so bright. And the three of them watched as this star descended closer and closer and closer. And as it got closer, they saw that it was a craft. The next thing that happened was that when the craft was about 50 feet over their heads, a beam of bluish white light and a cone came down over the three of them and they began to levitate up in this cone of light. Now, uh, if someone had done that to me at my age, I'd be have a little bit of trepidation because, you know, if you're going up, and the cone of light, I mean, the first thing that would come to my mind would be the fear of Panic. falling mm -hmm. back down. Yeah. You know, there's nothing holding you. But they had, uh, they had the absolute opposite feeling. Oh, wow, this is fun. We're having fun, you know, we're going up in this light. So they get up into the craft, and then they're in a, a round room that kind of uh, looks like a hangar. And uh, there are typical bumper sticker gray beings that are there. And so they say, well, you know, what's, what's happening? Man, what's, what's, what's going on? I said, you know, have no fear. You're going to be returned. You'll be fine. Uh, we're just going to you know, take a look at you folks for a few minutes and so on. But their, their fear was in being separated. Greater fear for each other than for each as an individual. Then when they finally were separated, they were taken down different corridors that went off this room. And under hypnotic regression is when they described what they saw off the corridors, which were rooms that looked like hospital rooms. And uh, the one that we went through most of the uh, hypnotic regression uh, was placed in a room, unclothed, uh, and placed on a table that he couldn't tell whether it was jutting out of the wall or whether it was on a pedestal. And uh, although he thought it was metallic,